Okay, so I want to talk to you about Genentech and Herceptin. And first, let me talk about Genentech. This is really an extraordinary company for a variety of reasons. And there's an MIT connection here as well, as with most things that we talk about here, MIT figures prominently. So Genentech was probably the very first real biotech company, uh, meaning taking specific ideas from biology and applying it to develop medicines. And before I tell you about Genentech, I need to describe to you uh, in very coarse terms what the, what the pharmaceutical industry was like prior to Genentech. And I, I'm going to give a, a very, very coarse and bastardized description of it. Those of you who are from the pharma industry, please feel free to weigh in and tell me uh, if I'm being inaccurate. But prior to the 1970s, prior to the revolution of biotechnology, the drug development business was really much more focused on chemistry rather than biology. The basic approach is you target a disease and you have a bunch of chemical compounds and you try them out on a bunch of patients and maybe it helps 10% of them and maybe it kills half a percent of them and that's considered a good drug and it gets approved with the appropriate warning labels. And as you can tell, that's a very coarse approach. And again, I'm oversimplifying. I apologize. But what happened in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s is a completely different approach to developing drugs. And Genentech was at the forefront. The idea was to actually now start to use biology as opposed to chemistry to create drugs. And it's to use biological agents as opposed to chemical compounds that would actually get injected into humans. So you understand the difference? A chemical compound is something that you manufacture synthetically in a lab. It's the white, uh, white uh, lab coat, uh, test tubes, the chemists you know, pouring all these different things in the beaker. Whereas biology is taking living things or taking stuff out of living things and putting them into human bodies. It's a different approach. That's one difference. The second difference is that the focus was not on this broad approach to trying out chemical compounds and seeing which ones worked and which ones didn't. But rather than a trial and error approach, it's to target the specific biological mechanism of a disease and to go after that mechanism. That's what we saw with Gleevec, uh, imatinib, that we talked about at the very first day of class. Novartis targeted a specific mechanism based upon a lot of good science and it worked fantastically well. So Genentech was part of that revolution, but their focus was quite different. So Genentech was started up in 1976 by two individuals, uh, Herbert Boyer, who is a biochemist at UCSF at the time, and Robert Swanson, who is a venture capitalist at Kleiner Perkins and also an MIT grad. So he graduated in 1970 from uh, course five he was a chemistry major, but he also got a Sloan master's degree at the same time. And uh, they went to California, joined Kleiner Perkins, became a venture capitalist. In 1976, he decided that it would be a good idea to create a company based upon the technology of recombinant DNA. Recombinant DNA was a tool that didn't really exist at the time, but the science was, you know, we can actually mix and match DNA from all sorts of things and actually create compounds that don't exist in nature. We can actually get bacteria to develop things that we want, like little factories. For example, human insulin. We can actually create it by inserting the appropriate instructions into the DNA of bacteria like E. coli or, or yeast. So Genentech was founded on that premise. And it started up with Robert Swanson, who at the time was 29 years old, called up Herbert Boyer and said, I'd like to meet with you and talk about an idea that I have. And Boyer said, you've got 10 minutes, because he had no time to talk to business people. His focus was on uh, developing uh, new research and thinking about patients. So they met, and that 10 minutes turned to three hours. And that three hours turned into the company Genentech that they, the two of them founded. They each put $500 into the company at the time to get it off the ground. And that's how the company got started. And one of the first products, a real product they developed, was human insulin. 
and they used the bacteria E. coli with the appropriate segment of DNA inserted in it to create human insulin for diabetics. And so now, you actually had a bunch of these bacteria in these large fermentation vats creating these compounds for individuals. And that was approved by the FDA, which is extraordinary because in those days, and even today, the vast majority of drugs that get approved are not approved by biotech. They, they are not developed and get approved for biotech companies. Big pharma companies uh, are involved. And sure enough, back then, a big pharma company did get involved. Eli Lilly partnered with Genentech to be able to do that. They were still focusing on basic R&D. So they started up by using these various different recombinant DNA techniques, making them commercially viable. And uh, in 1980, they did an IPO. And that IPO raised $35 million, which I know it doesn't sound like much nowadays, but in today's dollars, using bird pie, you know, that inflation index for biomedical R&D, that's equivalent to about $150 million. Now, I know that still doesn't sound big, but back in those days, there weren't a lot of biotech companies. In fact, there weren't any biotech companies. This is the beginning of the biotech industry. And in the first hour of trading, the IPO price went from $35 a share to $88 a share. So this was one of the real hot issues that year, and it began the entire biotech industry. Now that sounds like a great story, except that in 1990, they decided that they wanted to get more stable cash flows, and they did a deal with Roche, where Roche basically acquired a majority ownership in Genentech, and then ultimately in 2009, they completed that acquisition, and now Genentech doesn't exist anymore as a separate stock trading on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. It's all part of Roche. But up until 2009, it did trade separately because Roche said back in 1990, we're going to let you do this on your own and leave you to be independent even though we own you and we control you. We're not going to exercise our control. Just do good stuff and we'll be happy to take advantage of that and distribute it, market it, and so on. And they did. It's been a great partnership. If you take a look at that timeline, this is something that I got from the Genentech website. The timeline on the top are all of the drugs developed by Genentech. The bottom are all of the drugs developed by the much, much bigger pharma company, Roche. A little different, isn't it? So clearly, this was an incredible engine of new drug development. And with the financial backing of Roche, they were actually able to do it. This was not a straightforward deal, very controversial, because the idea that Swanson and Boyer had was to create a new pharma company of the future. They didn't want to do drug development the old way. They wanted to do it in a materially different way, which, which they did, but it was challenging for them to be able to be able to take the drugs all the way through approval and marketing. So in 1990, when they announced the deal, there was actually a fair bit of controversy. Uh, it was very exciting because there was lots of money involved. Roche said that they were going to be injecting 400 some million dollars into the company as part of the acquisition, and they were going to be able to get access to a lot of the pharmaceutical development services that they didn't have in-house. But at the time, this was viewed also as maybe selling out. In fact, that's the term that was used by the New York Times. Some scientists like the deal because it will provide more money for research and will shield Genentech from the Wall Street pressures that have been forcing the company to curtail some of the researchers' freedom. But others were worried. Some people think the company has sold out. So there was definitely a, a number of warnings that were issued at the time about the degree of independence. In, in the end, I think overall, the uh, uh, story has worked out pretty well. Um, Genentech continues to have a separate identity. They continue to be uh, extremely innovative in what they're doing. But nonetheless, you can see that the financial pressures actually mattered. And let me illustrate to you what those financial pressures were. So this is a chart of the cumulative return of a dollar invested in the S&P 500 versus a dollar invested in Genentech starting in 1980 going all the way through uh, the end of the trading of Genentech in 2008, December. And you can see that you know, the IPO was fine, and they had relatively stable uh, results, not moving much up or down relative to the S&P. 
Uh, but then in 1986, they ended up doing better than the S&P, then they started doing worse than the S&P, and then they tracked the S&P, and then uh, towards the uh, end of the 1990s, did really well, really badly, really well, really badly, and the volatility has just been extraordinary. I'll show you that uh, towards the end of class today when we talk about risk and reward. So you can see why having a very well-endowed parent is important because left to their own devices, the volatility would end up making it very difficult to raise capital, particularly at the times when they need it most because scientific breakthroughs are not necessarily correlated with market upswings or downturns. And so that was the challenge. And you know, ultimately, you've got to make a decision. We're going to come back to this when we talk about Herceptin because there's some interesting aspects of that story that are directly related to what went on during the 1980s and 90s.